So uh, can you hear me, Scott and Julie, okay? Yes, I can. Yes. Okay, great. We're all unmuted. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> okay, well, I have that it's 11 o'clock and it's time for us to start. So I wanted to, to welcome everyone that's uh, logged in right now. And uh, we're going to be doing a webinar with Scott and Julie about their iPipe um, platform, the Integrated Pest Information Platform for Extension and Education. We're going to learn what it is and why you should care. And uh, Julie's going to do some live demonstrations of their app and their website, which is actually very cool. So I'm looking forward to uh, sharing this with you all. Um, so I wanted to just cover some housekeeping things before, uh, before we begin. And um, there's going to be a recording of this webinar, and uh, it will be up on our website at this link uh, in a few days. It takes us a little while to edit it and uh, put it up there, but uh, you'll be able to find that in a, in a little while. And uh, we welcome your questions. Um, in fact, we've got time uh, throughout for you to ask your questions and get them answered. We'd love to be, uh, this to be interactive and as useful as possible for you. And um, so there is a feature on Zoom. If you scroll your mouse over, the, um, over your Zoom window, you'll see there's a box that comes up and it has, at mine it's on the top of the screen, but I know sometimes it's on the bottom of the screen. And there's a little square box that says Q and A. And uh, if you click on that Q and A feature, <clears throat> you can type in your questions. And um, there's also an opportunity in there to ask questions anonymously. So if you uh, don't want everyone to know that you're asking a stupid question, <laughs> you can uh, choose the anonymous feature and we will never know, but we can answer it for you. So, um, so please feel free to use that. And we'll be stopping periodically through to, uh, to see what questions there are and um, ask Scott and Julie for the answers. And um, so with that, I'm going to introduce uh, both Scott and Julie. So Scott Assad is a professor of aerobiology in the Department of Plant Pathology and Environmental Microbiology at Pennsylvania State University. And Julie Gollard is the national coordinator for IPIPE. They've collaborated in leading teams to operate the soy, soybean rust information system, the IPM pipe, and currently IPIPE. And the $7 million five-year IPIPE uh, cap is currently in its third year. And uh, so we're going to be seeing today the results of the labor for the last three years, and uh, it's beautifully impressive. So welcome, Scott, and welcome, Julie. So Thank you. Great. And uh, Scott, uh, you're going to uh, introduce iPipe to us. And uh, what is iPipe? Well, iPipe's all about uh, increasing sharing of observations, uh, observational data on pests and beneficial organisms in agriculture. Uh, I think uh, we all realize that uh, hundreds of, of uh, people are out there collecting thousands of observations during the growing season in our country, uh, and they're using those data for, for management decisions on their farms. Uh, but uh, these data are not really shared uh, in real time or near real time with others in ways that they're they could be uh, useful. And so IPIPE is about creating a, a culture of sharing these observations uh, to improve crop management. Uh, we kind of contrib want to contribute to our nation's infrastructure for food security, uh, build uh, the capacity to respond uh, can I just uh, can I can I just interrupt you for one second? I've had a couple of people who are just uh, pinging me, saying that they can't hear you very well. Is it possible for you to turn up your volume? Uh, I uh, hope so. That, that is much better. Stay there. <laughs> uh, yeah. I think that's what it is. I think you were talking at the other computer rather than. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Was that just it? That is so much better. So okay. Let me get rid of that. Uh, should I start all over or you want me to continue at this point? Uh, no, maybe you want to just kind of recap briefly what you've gone over because I think of quite a few people having problems hearing you. So. Okay, so IPIPE is all about sharing uh, observational data on pests and beneficial uh, insects uh, important to agriculture. Uh, there's a lot of observations that are being made by, by hundreds of thousands of individuals during the growing season. These are generally used locally to, to manage pests. 
uh, but they're not shared uh, with others uh, who could use them too for, for management. And so iPipe's all about changing the culture of sharing pest and, uh, observations and, and observations of beneficial organisms uh, that are important to agriculture. And you know, some of our goals are to, to uh, contribute to our nation's uh, infrastructure for food security, uh, be able to build the capacity to respond to pest problems when they arise. Uh, we have IPM objectives as well. And of course, we want to uh, work to uh, enhance farm profitability. Do I change to the next slide or is that something you I can, I can do that. There we go. Okay. And what we're going to talk about today is just a, a really a small portion of the iPipe. Uh, I've listed the topics there, uh, the benefits of participating, uh, how we share observations, and then we're going to talk about some of the tools. Julie will do most of this, the, the apps for collecting observations and mapping capabilities, our modeling capabilities, and our communication tools. One of the things, one of the very important things about iPipe that we're not going to talk about is the uh, student, undergraduate student intern program. Uh, this has been some of the, uh, it's one of the most rewarding, I guess, for us uh, aspects of the iPipe. But, uh, you know, and we have interns from, from 28 uh, crop pest programs spread across the nation that participate in, and, uh, you know, get hands-on ex extension-like experiences. Next slide, please. So Daisy, hold on. There we go. Okay, so so why why would you think of, of uh, participating in the iPipe? One reason might be that you believe in the mission that we need to uh, share uh, observations in near real time so we can use uh, some of the cyber age technologies to, to, you know, produce information products that are useful for management, you know, improve our culture, improve IPM. Uh, another reason uh, is that some of the tools that iPipe has developed over the last three years may make what you do quicker and easier for you. Uh, maybe the mapping and modeling capabilities uh, might enhance uh, your understanding of the pests that you deal with or, or the beneficial organisms that you consider. And finally, we have some automated communication tools and some pest alerts that may be of interest. Next slide, please. Okay, so uh, we share pest observations and we have a, a number of guiding principles that we use for, for doing so. Uh, we want to engage stakeholders of all sorts. They can be extension professionals, they can be farmers, crop consultants, uh, to share pest observations. But at the same time, we know we need to protect the privacy and professionalism of those who, who participate, whether they're individuals or government agencies or private companies. Uh, we really want to empower extension professionals, uh, that's one of our very important goals. And we realize that there are a lot of other IT platforms, information technology platforms out there that are collecting observations on pests. And we want to partner with them. We want to develop ways of sharing data with them in near real time so we can produce uh, important information products. Next slide, please. Now we have in iPipe a whole bunch of rules for, for sharing pest observations. And these are just kind of the, the highlights of how we treat pest observations uh, that are submitted by participants. Uh, first of all, participants retain the ownership of their, their observations outside uh, the system. They can use them for publications, they can use them for pest alerts, whatever they need to use. The, the, the data is theirs outside the system. But, but iPipe also owns the data that's submitted to it, and we share it among authorized participants, those who participate according to, to a bunch of rules. Uh, our, our, our first and foremost rule is that observations are shared at the county level of resolution, unless the observer specifies that he or she would like to share them at the point 
level resolution. This preserves the privacy, which is important in some situations. However, uh, observers can form teams. Uh, and if they do form teams, then they can share observations at point resolution. And this may be uh, very important uh, when, um, you know, in, in big monitoring programs that involve multiple people, uh, they can see at the point what they, they can, uh, what they've, you know, what their, their colleagues have input into the system. And another um, rule is that shared observations cannot be taken outside the system. Your own observations, the participants' own observations, and those observations of the team members may be downloaded maybe in a spreadsheet or something like that. And uh, you can make uh, products, data products, uh, maps essentially, uh, with your own data that can be taken outside of the system. But you cannot take other people's data that's been shared to you within the system outside the system. Now, there's a caveat on all this, and that is that the privacy statute is only imposed for three years uh, after the, the, the observation date. And then after that time, uh, we have a repository uh, for iPipe data. And the purpose here is uh, that uh, we want these data to be available for researchers, for extension professionals uh, in the future so that we can prove uh, our pest management options. And uh, we use the uh, University of Georgia Center for Invasive Species and Ecosystem Health, better known as Bugwood, as the repository for uh, iPipe data. Next Thanks. slide. Yeah, it sounds like you've uh, put a lot of thought into making it uh, a safe place for people to share data. And actually, one of the questions that we've had come in is, uh, why aren't people sharing information? And will iPipe significantly change this? And what makes you think so? Well, um, the why question is a difficult one. Uh, and I think it, it's historical. If, if you know, some of my background is in, in meteorology, and, and meteorologists have shared uh, data since the 1850s, when 150, you know, professors at universities or, or uh, institutions got together and started sending their daily weather observations to the Smithsonian mm -hmm. uh, using the latest technology, which was the telegraph, and they've keep, kept that up. And now you can take your smartphone and take a picture and send it to the uh, Weather Channel. And if it's a valuable picture, they're incorporated into the public warning. You know, so it, it's been done in other, other arenas. Why not in agriculture? Um, because pests are seen maybe as being bad. And, and uh, I think it's easier to share data on beneficials than it is on, on pests. But, um, you know, I, I think that's the real reason that the culture hasn't developed. Um, but certainly there are, uh, if we had, you know, distributional data in real time, you know, especially for pests that move in the air uh, or move from, from one field to another, uh, it would be useful, very useful for management purposes. I'm not sure that answered the question or all of the question, but part of it. Yeah, no, what I'm hearing is that if you make a tool that's really useful, um, which iPipe is, that it may overcome some of the hesitations about people uh, wanting to share where there are past problems, and uh, I, can, I can hear that. So, mm -hmm. Okay, and we'll go to the next slide. And, okay. okay, let me um, introduce Julia essentially with this slide and, and uh, say that you know, there are lots of ways to to uh, enter pest observations into the iPipe. Uh, Julie will show you the, the apps, some of the apps uh, that are, uh, are used now, but we can also uh, enter data more in more traditional ways, online forms, spreadsheets. Uh, and uh, you know, in terms of the apps, we have two apps uh, that, are, that are being used, uh, a full app, which is generally used by extension specialists because they can define the data forms, what types of data they want to collect. Uh, it's also good for, for 
for researchers, but uh, basically for scientists conducting surveys. And then we have a light app, which is really uh, tailored to the, the non-scientist. Uh, it's easy to use, it's, it's uh, picture driven, uh, and it, it focuses uh, on core information. Uh, with that, let me turn the uh, presentation over to Julie to show you some of these tools. Thank you, Scott. So let me just turn on my screen. So Julie's going to share her screen with us and be able to sh uh, show us the app live. So she's going to work through it with, with us so we can see it. So. Right. And so to use both of the, uh, or either of these apps, you do have need a iPipe account. It's fairly easy to get. You just go to our site, ipipe.zxa.com. You make a request and an email will be sent to you almost uh, instantaneously with your account information, which you would... Uh, enter into the app. Uh, you can download either one of these apps, the full app or the light app from Google Play or Apple Store. And I've already done that just to make it more efficient. So I'll show you the light app first. And we deployed it uh, earlier this year. So once you enter your password, you will get taken to this preference section. And as Scott mentioned, it is image driven, uh, icon driven. And so here you see a list of crops that we have in our system and then past the range uh, under the crops. And so you would specify what it is that you want to collect data for. Because this is a live system, we, we don't want to enter any fake data. We've created what we call this demo crop and demo past under it. And that allows people to experiment or show the system as I'm doing now without putting any dummy data in, All right? So by default, everything is turned off, and then you click on the icon uh, to select what it is you want to scout for. So again, I'm doing these demo pathogens, insects. Once you've made your selection, you go to this menu option on top, and you click the scouter. And again, as, as Scott mentioned, what we're trying to collect is the core data and do it as efficiently as possible with the slide app. So I've selected a black raspberry before as a crop, but again, uh, we're gonna do the demo crop. I'm gonna click on the icon. And again, this is the selection I made previously under preferences. Um, what we call unknown pests and un unanticipated pests are added to every crop. Unknown pests, uh, as the name suggests, is something you don't know. And maybe you'll uh, wait for lab verification uh, to identify it. Unanticipated pests, it may be something we don't have in the system right now. Uh, but you know what it is, so you will enter it as unanticipated pest, and then we can go into the system later and uh, correct that. So again, it's really simple. You click on the icon. You have uh, this new menu comes up. By default, once you click that, scout it turns to yes, presence turns to no. Um, you can enter any notes, and you click close. So it's uh, really a matter of seconds to be able to say that something was scouted and not found. If you want to say that something was found, you turn the present status to yes. Again, you can provide any notes. You can also take an image. Let's do that. It's not very, collect a couple of leaves today, but it'd be more interesting where you're out in the field. And you can associate that with the observation. You can see a little icon in the corner. Now, if you're doing multiple stops within the field, you, you know, as you progress to the field, you can add a new stop and go through the same process again. You can click on it and your menu will come up. Yep. And uh, um, you collect the data. Now, the GPS coordinates are uh, recorded by default. So right now it just says that I'm in Hartford County in Connecticut. If we toggle this, It'll show you the GPS coordinates. So once you're done, you've collected everything you meant to collect, you save, and that saves it locally to the device. So just do that. Uh, if you try to leave the screen without saving, it'll give you an error message. So now it's just saved locally. And if you, you want to send the data to us, you click sync. And again, you can sync while you're out in the field or back in the office. Okay, and actually that kind of leads to a question that someone has posted, which is, does the user need to be online when they enter the data or can they upload it once they get to an internet connection? 
So th uh, this was specifically uh, designed so you can do it out in the field without an internet connection. However, what you do need to have is some kind of a satellite connection. Okay. So we need to know where you are. So it will not work well if we do not know where you are because that information is collected automatically. And that's just done to make it simpler for the user. Okay, so if there's no signal, it would be a problem. No signal, right. Okay. But generally, you know, you can have a data signal and not a, you know, a Wi-Fi signal or a, um, a stronger signal. So GPS, you can uh, get a GPS signal easier than you can get the other types of signal out in the field with poor, poor connectivity. So. Okay, great, thank you. So the other thing I want to show you is uh, the full app. And the full app was created really for research uh, extension specialists because you can specify uh, more of the data fields you want to collect and it's much more extensive. So we customize it for each crop pest programs. As Scott mentions, we have 28 of these to this point. And here you can you know, specify locations, observations, traps. We can break out observations in various ways. Also, unlike the uh, light app, here you can um, choose to tell us only the political state county instead of providing the specific GPS information. And as you can see, if I, as I click through this, some of the forms are fairly extensive and some are pretty simple, it's the strip form. So again, we, we customize this for each crop pest program, but it works the same way. You save it locally and then you sync and provide the data to us. And any user can use either of these apps. The only thing you need is an iPipe account. Okay. Actually, that leads to another question someone asked, uh, which is, can the user uh, use this app beyond the US, for example, in Africa? It's a good question. We've thought about it. Uh, you know, I don't, we don't have anybody using it outside. Well, no, you know, Canada is on board and using it, but we don't have anybody right now that's using it in Africa, for example, but there's nothing limiting it where it couldn't be used there. Okay, so it's possible, it's just- yeah, Absolutely, yes. Okay, great. Well, I'm sure that person will be interested to hear that, so, okay. So what I want to now, and I'll give me a second to switch, is show you when we go online, so obviously you've collected the data, now you want to see it mapped geospatially. So I'm going to go on to the participant site. And again, it's the same uh, user password that you, we use for the apps. Let me switch over. And hopefully now you're seeing my screen. Yes, we are. So again, uh, when you log in, you're taken to this account screen by default. Um, as Scott mentioned earlier, in addition to using the apps to enter data, you can data, enter data online through these single entry forms. And these are the same forms you'd find in the full iPipe app, or you can use, again, uh, the same format, but you can uh, do bulk upload by downloading the template and then uploading it back into the system. We have this data tree section where you can edit observations. And then the other option here is to download your observations. And there's various ways to filter those. And those will be emailed to you once the, um, the process is complete. So again, not only using the apps, but you can use the online platform to enter data. So let's go to the, so now you want to map everything you've, ma uh, you've collected and to see what everybody else has collected within your group and outside your group. So you go through this. We have these roles on top, the analyst role and data analysis tool. So uh, there's a number of filters that we have in order to map your data because by default, there's nothing on the map. So we click this menu icon. So the first thing you wanna do is select what it is that you wanna map. So I uh, want to map the true armyworm in this case, and these data were collected through Illinois Monitoring Network. They have over 60 cooperators working on, on this project and collecting data, so it's a pretty interesting data set. In the filter, you can select multiple pests 
TMAP or organisms, beneficial to TMAP at the same time, we would suggest that you just do one organism at a time because we do not provide a unique symbol to differentiate the, the organisms and can become a bit confusing. So we'd say make one selection, map it, and then make another selection. And actually, somebody's asked a question of, uh, will sure. fruit be added to the list of crop hosts? So we have various, yeah, fruits. Unlike the apps here, it's not separated by crops, so it's, everything is listed together. Okay, great. So if you went through this whole list, yeah, you'd see some fruit pests. Okay, great. And again, this list expands as we get more crop pest programs into the system or we get users into the system that are scouting something that we haven't thought of before or hasn't been part of the system before. So after you selected your pest, the next thing you want to select is your date range. And here, uh, right now, it's limited to specific to any given year. You can change that. And here, using this bar, you can change the beginning date or the end date. Okay. Demonstrate that. Or you can type in the date. What's really uh, interesting with this, and let me zoom into the map a little bit more, is that we, you can do what I call manual animation. So if I take this end bar to the very end, you can progress through time and you can see how the map gets populated. And again, you can do the same thing by just in the beginning date. Mm -hmm. So let's go back to today. So you can see when a pest is emerging, or at least when Yes. Very cool. Yep. So we've selected our date range. Let's minimize this. And then you can do some other filter options. So if we go under data, we have something called data sources. So I can just adjust the map and zoom in a little bit more. So as Scott mentioned, privacy is a big concern to us and to the users of the system. So the way we do it is by identifying your own data, your group data, and data shared by other users of the system. So I'm going to turn off all of this first. So right now, I actually don't have any data that I enter for this organism for Illinois because, again, I don't want to enter any dummy data, and I'm not the one doing the scouting. But I have made myself part of this Illinois scouting group. So when I turn on the group data, I see all the data, and, it's provide, and I see it at the resolution which it was provided. So we, if we have the lat long, you'll see it at the lat long resolution. Also, the symbol you see for the my group, for your data or group data is a circle. A whole circle means a uh, lat long was provided. A donut symbol indicates that no GPS was provided. So we put it at the centroid of the county. And what do the numbers re represent the number of instances? So in, in this case, and I'll go over this now in more detail, it um, indicates number of observations. Okay. And so the other option we have is summary data. So summary data looks at all the data in the county for the past, be it your data, your group data, or data provided uh, by any other user of the system, and it puts it at the centroid of the county, again, for uh, privacy reasons. And it's represented as a square. The other way you can filter the data is through observation types. And it's kind of data confidence, so you can say, uh, if a grower or consultant provides the data, just field observation will go in this unconfirmed. Anything with a f uh, field test will go in this diagnostic test. Data by, provided by extension will go under extension and anything provided by a lab, a regular lab will be, go under certified lab or we have the USDA lab designation. Again, you can turn these filters on and off. So in addition to all that, there's different ways you can view the data. So by default, what you see here is the presence absence map. And we'll do that under views. You also have the option of doing an abundance map, which is just a count. So if we have counts provided, they're not always provided. You can view it that way. Mm -hmm. Obviously, uh, you want to be, be able to see the legend. So if you close out of the menu, and you click on this eye icon, you can see the legend for whatever is being displayed. So again, if we go back to the presence absence map, this is the aggregate map. So it looks at all the data in the date range provided. It summarizes and it averages based on um, unique locations. So what we call unique locations is anything where we have GPS coordinates. If we do not have GPS coordinates, we can't really identify it. So we group all of those locations together. 
The other thing you can look at is the most recent option, which looks at, again, looks at the date range, and it looks at the last observation within that rate, date range for a specific location. But the date can be very different. So if we were to uh, select this point, for example, and this is our query tool, also gives you these summary statistics in the very beginning. And we were uh, to scroll through this list option, we'll see that the last observation was the, on the 26th. But for this point, the last observation was on the 29th of June. So it's the most recent, but the date for the most recent observation is very different based on location. And you can do the same thing with abundance. And again, you can query the points and they provide you various statistics. Um, you can look at specific observations. If this is your own observation, you would also be able to edit it. And you can also look at this as a graph. We also divide uh, counties into these quadrants. And uh, we show you uh, where the observations within the state uh, are located. If, if we do not have the lat long, we put in the northeast quadrant. Again, so I just, and we are always expanding. So right now we have this presence absence view and abundance view. We plan to introduce other views, things like severity incidents, maybe um, average counts. Mm -hmm. And so as we get requests, we expand uh, the view options and other filter options. Great, thank you. And so um, the other thing in addition to data is we have various products. And so the way you would do that is again, you'll go under filters, you select what pests you wanna see. And in this case, we'll turn off true armyworm and go to corn borer. Again, you would do date range, but date range works a little differently for products. So for products, it looks at the last date in this calendar. And then we go under the products menu. And here we have different sources. So uh, some models were provided by North Carolina State, some were developed by ZX. We have weather data products. So you would select what sources you're interested in. All of the weather products are provided under generic, are listed under the generic tab. You can see there's various weather products. Let me zoom out a little bit. And again, you want to close out of this menu to be able to see the legend. And again, you can adjust the dates. Right now, we're viewing the model product for uh, the 12th. We have forecast data going out seven days, so you can adjust that going in the future. And I went a little too far. Let's go to the 16th. Or you can go back in time. And again, now I'm viewing the model product for the 16th of August. And we have various. Uh, pest specific models, in this case, a European corn borer. And there's two products for this model, the multivoltin phenology and the univoltin phenology. Again, you can zoom in, zoom out, and you can impose observations on top of that. If you don't want to uh, go into the system every time to look at these model products, we have this uh, scheduler option. So you click on this little icon here you say you want to add it to the scheduler, you go under my account, select the scheduler, and you specify that you want to get this product, um, how, how frequently you want to get this product, the format you want to get it in, and this will be emailed to you at the frequency you specified in the format you requested. Mm -hmm. uh, before we conclude, I just want to go back and show you the data we uploaded using the Light app to show you that it does work. So again, I'm gonna go through the filter. I'm gonna select, I believe, with the demo insect. And I'll break my own rule. I'll, I'll do a couple of organisms here. Yeah. And again, you'll see we don't uh, identify them with a unique symbol, so it can get a bit confusing. And this will be a good example to show you how um, the data filtering works for data sources. Just <clears throat> that one's in a little bit. 
So again, in this case, I do have data. So if I turn in my data, you'll see the points I just uploaded. It'll be a circle. You'll see where there's four observations, two unique data points. Now, if somebody else were to look at this data, it would look like this to them. Mm -hmm. As a square that's situated uh, in the centroid of the county. And if they were to um, look at the data, the lat long would be blocked out. Again, for privacy reasons. And can you overlay uh, the winds on here? Um, you showed me that earlier, and I thought that was very neat how you can show the wind, pa wind patterns. So yes, you can go under the products selection. And overlay that with any of the data you have. So that's kind of the core that being able to enter data and being able to view the data. So there are a couple of questions that have come in. Um, can you uh, use the app or I guess the, uh, this uh, website to um, ID pests? So not, not directly, but we're hoping to work with labs and be able to um, incorporate that, that data with the scouting data. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right, thank you. And then another one, uh, somebody said, um, um, collect information about weeds, question mark. What specifically? So I'm not entirely sure. What, so um, yes, we're, you know, we've, we've been talking about pests, but obviously we can collect data on any organism, beneficials and weeds. And in the light app, you do have presence absence um, information, but we also allow coordinators to specify an additional question they can ask of the users of the light app. So that's specific to the, organism and to the state. So if you're doing weeds and you want to know some um, way to measure, um, probably not incidents, but extent, we can uh, add a question for weeds that would capture that. Okay, so, a, you know, acreage, something of, of that sort. Yeah, we can add it to the light app and with the full app, we can create a form uh, that would capture those questions. Great. And then somebody else has said, um, how do we check the accuracy of abundance data? And um, um, what's the minimal geographical unit in IPIPE, county or township? So it's either lat long or county. We don't go down to township. Okay. Um, you know, we're, we're hoping to implement some QA, QC tools that would flag things that don't seem correct based on other data coming in. So for example, if your abundance is uh, you know, 60 insects and somebody in the same time frame with the same geographic area says it's 110 or it's one, we can begin to flag some of those data and see if there's any discrepancies. Okay. Right. Thank you. Oh, great. Um, so um, is this the, what you wanted to show us about the, the apps and the site? Yes. Okay, great. And, um, and then another question has just come through. Uh, could you please advise how pest alerts are provided in the system? So right now we have pest alerts that we've created for extension specialists. So when we have a new county find, they get alerted. Um, so they're aware of it and then they can post it to our public site, uh, we'll, which we'll, Scott will mention in a little bit. And we hope in the near future to implement alerts to the other users of the system when something new comes in, when something comes in within their general geographic area. We don't have it in the system now, but we're hoping to add it soon. All right. Great, thank you. Okay. Great, so shall we move back to, uh, to the PowerPoints and to Scott to give an overview of, um, of what we've just seen so people understand the robustness of the system. And I'm going to do that now. There you go. Great. Okay. You should see my, uh, my screen again. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Jana. Um, so Julie's shown all this, uh, the map mapping capabilities uh, that, that users can, can customize their map, selecting layers, filters, data, and products. Right? And, and here I kind of summarize what those, those uh, options are. Uh, basic or satellite map layers, filters are your pests, Julie showed us, and you have different views and data sources. 
uh, and we have uh, a variety of different products. Uh, what what um, Julie didn't mention there is that we have uh, people here that would help you get modeling products on the iPipe. We're always looking for new models and it's kind of a plug and play system. So if you have a pest risk model uh, that you want to incorporate, uh, we'll work with you to do so. Uh, and Julian indicated that you can save your settings and schedule deliveries. Uh, next, next slide, please. And actually, Scott, um, mm -hmm. somebody asked a question about this is, uh, what's your relationship with Pioneer and they are model uh, providers? Uh, right now, uh, it's, it's almost non-existent to be truthful. Uh, in the uh, last year or so, uh, we worked with them uh, to develop uh, some of their, uh, to, to, to develop models for them, uh, or with them, I should say. Um, you know, but, but uh, right now, uh, the answer to that question is we're not really uh, involved with, with Pioneer anymore. All right, thank you. Next slide. Slide, there we go, all right. Uh, Julie also showed you the, the, how you can um, view observations on, on the maps, uh, depending on whether uh, they're your observations or they're your group observations or they're shared observations. You see, uh, you see them at different resolutions, so you see different amounts of information. Uh, and uh, she didn't show you how, but she mentioned that if it is your data, you can edit maps. Mm -hmm. Um, and we use, as, as you saw, shape and color and numbers associated with symbols to, to provide valuable information on the displays. Next slide, please. Uh, we Julie showed you some of our mapping products, our pest risk model output. Uh, we can overlay them on observation maps. Uh, she showed that as well. And, and the model products uh, include uh, phonology, about weather variables and phonology for crops and insects and also uh, presence and absence uh, data intensity or severity depending whether it's insects or diseases and we have a few aerobiology uh, transport models uh, in the system and again for these these models uh, you can save your settings and schedule delivery so you can get updated uh, information uh, to your personal devices. Next slide, please. Uh, now to, to communication uh, tools and I guess to the alerts. Uh, we have on the iPipe an, an ex, uh, extension public site. Uh, that is our communication tool that some of the uh, extension professionals uh, who are part of iPipe use. Uh, you know, you can also take uh, products uh, out of the system and some extension professionals do that as well and use them on their own personal or university sites. Uh, the, the, uh, the extension site is, is really operates as a blog. Uh, it consists of posts and the, that are tagged uh, and it, extension professionals who, who make these posts tag them themselves and the tags are used by users as search terms. Uh, the post can contain a variety of types of information, images, and of course, texts and links and, and references, whatever. Um, and uh, participants, well, in this case, as Julie said, only extension professionals right now can be alerted to first finds of a pest in a geography, but we're working uh, to expand that uh, probably next year. Next slide. Uh, for, for our pest crop programs in the system, we've developed IPM elements. We've worked with the extension professionals uh, that coordinate these programs and the IPM Institute in Madison, Wisconsin, uh, and North Carolina State University to create IPM elements. IPM elements are an old concept uh, and essentially they're lists of, of and crop specific uh, and, and region-specific uh, best practices. And uh, these are public, and so growers uh, can go in and uh, look at the various 
types of pra uh, practices and, and get information on these practices and actually rate themselves uh, with respect to how, how much, you know, what, what potential practices they are using uh, if, if they want to. Uh, so this is a, an IPM tool that uh, we create and it's available uh, on the iPad. Next slide, please. And so that brings us to, to, how, to how you can access the iPipe. Uh, you're looking at our, our, uh, our kind of homepage, our, what do we, uh, we call it, the... Um, the portal. Uh, yep. The portal, excuse me, the iPipe portal. Uh, I grabbed this off the internet so the slide doesn't look too good, but we have, since the iPipe uh, uh, is composed of six websites, uh, Julie showed you the participant website, which is restricted to participants, and you need to, to get a, an account, to ask for an account to, to use it. Uh, but we have an outreach website, and there um, you can go to this website, and you can see really the details of the iPipe project and uh, all the crop pest programs, a little bit of information on all the crop pest programs that, that participate, and essentially what we're all about. Uh, I mentioned the IPM Elements website. That, too, is an, a public website for, for anybody who wants to uh, look at the elements. Uh, the extension website, I mentioned that as well. Uh, then the, the, the National Pest uh, Repository, Observation Repository website, that's Bugwood. That's the UGA uh, Center that is the repository for iPipe data, but it also contains other data on, on pests and beneficial insects. And finally, we have an intern website. At the beginning, I, I indicated that interns is, are a very important component of the iPipe, trying to provide uh, young uh, potential scientists, researchers with, with hands-on ex extension experiences and, and experiences sharing uh, pest observations and interacting with, with stakeholders. This is a, a private, uh, restricted, I should say, website restricted to interns and their mentors, the coordinators. And uh, on this, they have some modules, educational modules and, and uh, opportunities for professional experiences and a blog, a very interesting blog where they report on their experiences and share them with other interns around the country. Uh, so, uh, if you're interested in accessing the, the iPipe website, this is this is what we should do. This is where you should go. And I think with that, that that um, you know ends the the, uh, the presentation that we we uh, you know uh, plan. But uh, it's now I think open for for questions, and we'll try to answer any of your questions. Yep, and we have a few questions. Um, so Vicki Moran asked, under the pest, um, is there any chance that you can have the ability to look at a photograph of the pest to help confirm the ID? Uh, yes. Uh, Julie, you wanna, you wanna respond to that? Yes, yeah, so right now we have the ability to capture an image with the light app, and then when you view the observation, you can look at it. We will also introduce that um, functionality in the full app. So when you go into the platform and you look at your observations, you will be able to bring up the image and others will be able to look at the image you took as well. Okay. Because that ability is there and we will expand it. I think the question is the other way around. Um, is there a photograph of the past that you could then confirm your identification with it? No, so currently there isn't, but we, uh, we can work on developing links to things like Bugwood, which has a lot of resources uh, with a lot of images that others uh, have uploaded um, that help with identification. So we can definitely pr uh, make those linkages. Okay, All right, great, thank you. Um, and Charlie Rush asked, uh, does iPipe coordinate with the NPDN slash PDIS system? So it's, it's something we're working on, or partly through Bugwood, partly independently. It is our goal to coordinate with the lab, such as the NPDN network, uh, you know, PDIS system within that. Again, that's a work in progress. We don't have those connections firmly established yet. Okay, lovely. Thank you. Um, and are there any future plans for the iPipe uh, for extension and education? Wow, that's a big question. 
uh, yes, I mean, in the, in the sense that uh, we're trying to uh, integrate ourselves with uh, or, or, or work with the IPM centers, uh, the directors of those centers, they're, they're part of the system, they're on our advisory board, our governing board, and uh, we want to uh, provide services, essentially, IT services for a lot of the area-wide uh, programs that are funded under EIP, uh, you know, EIP projects, uh, and so that's kind of where we're going. We, we, you know, also, you know, we're we're trying to get individuals involved. We're we're working on on uh, industry, uh, seeing if 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 uh, companies like BASF or or Pioneer uh, would value these services and and participate and contribute. Uh, pest observations, uh, as well as, you know, the, the government agencies. All right, thank you. And uh, that question was asked by Mohamed Hasib, and maybe he, he has uh, suggestions, which is maybe underlying the question. I'm sure you'd be happy to hear them. So. Um, and uh, from uh, Yajin Zhang, um, when I add an insect observation, do I need to identify it uh, to the family level can I just separate them into big groups like honeybees, bumblebees, wild bees? So right now it is a genus or species specific, but you know, if there is a, a large effort or consensus that they want to do it to family level and there's a value to that, we can definitely discuss that and add that as an option. Okay, great, great. thank you. And um, I'm just uh, looking through. So, um, there's been a huge amount of work put into this program, and it's surprising that not as many people know about it as it would seem. Does the name IPIPE make the program less recognized than it could be otherwise? What marketing has been done, and have there been any suggestions about the, the name? Well, starting with the, the end, um, the last question, no, there hasn't been any other suggestions about the name. Uh, the name has been around for uh, a dozen years. Uh, there was the soybean rust pest information for, for extension and education, which evolved into the IPM uh, pipe uh, funded by NIFA. Uh, and that is, was phased, that kind of evolved into the IPIPE. Uh, but no, there, there hasn't been... Uh, a big to do about the name. Uh, in terms, <clears throat> I'm trying to think of the 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 earlier part of that question. Um, and aspects of marketing. Too. So I, I think uh, you know to add to that, generally for marketing, we rely on the coordinators that have um, ties to the state, uh, to the growers in the state, to the consultant in in the state to do a lot of the marketing and promotion, um, and that's been generally how we get the word out. I mean, there are websites like the portal and the extension website, but I think we've been working with the coordinators and the interns for marketing to get the word out there. Okay. But I might. Also, also uh, over the past five years, we've taken on uh, seven crop pest programs uh, each year, and uh, we've issued an RFA uh, through the uh, regional IPM centers, uh, the directors uh, have issued this, are, you know, have, have tried to contact their constituency uh, about the IPIPE, and actually it's the center directors that together have, have chosen the, the uh, crop pest programs that we bring on uh, each year. Great. So as I say, people have suggestions uh, for uh, ways of spreading the word. I'm sure um, you'd be happy to hear, to hear about that. So. Um, we have a couple more questions. Um, um, somebody, Vicky Marone, who asked one of the earlier questions, uh, you mentioned that there are things that you could add as an option. Uh, who would she contact um, about that possibility? So you can contact either Scott or me, or we have a general email address at ipipesupport. Okay. ZXAIM.com. So yeah, if you reach out to any one of us, we coordinate between us, and we go through all the suggestions, and we love receiving them. Okay, great, wonderful. 
And uh, Beth Reed asked, um, how does this information, uh, this system inform grower management decisions? Are there plans for more real-time sharing with uh, public and growers apart from um, uh, the extension ipipe.org, which doesn't share all the pests? Okay. Um. And I can break that up into two questions. Which it sounds like, so the first part is, how does this system inform grower management decisions? Okay, so the extension professionals that coordinate the, the crop pest programs or any other, you know, extension professional who, who uh, is involved independently can take these maps out of the system, the, the, the products out of the system, and use them in, in traditional, more traditional uh, you know, communications to, to growers. And, and so that's one way that they're used. Uh, and probably right now, that's the, the, the most popular way or the way they use uh, most often. Uh, and growers can get to the extension website and, and use that as well. But that's not as, that hasn't been populated uh, as, you know, in, uh, that much. Uh, and so it, it, it's the, the way that the information gets to the grower most often is through the extension professionals that uh, participate in the iPad, through their exterior uh, communication lines. Great. And some of the other things we've discussed right now, all of our apps are pulling data. What we're hoping for in the future, and you know, this is ever expanding, is to push notification alerts through the app. So if the extension wants to communicate um, to the growers or data collectors in the area, not personally, but in a general terms based on geography or what data they're, being, they're collecting, uh, we can accomplish through the apps. And so the grower consultant is more aware of the management that should be undertaken in their specific area. Okay, great, lovely, thank you. All right, I think that's going to be our last question. Uh, so we'll move on with just uh, wrapping up here. Um, there's a couple of things that I want to share. Um, the um, IPM, Northeastern IPM Center, we've just uh, developed a, a new page on our website where you can um, uh, put a little profile if you're looking to a colleague for collaboration. It's called Find a Colleague, and you can see here the very first link is where you can enter information about creating your own profile. And it's just a very short blurb. You know, there's a photograph and your affiliation, contact information, and um, what you're researching, what you're working on, and the kind of collaborations you'd be interested in. And then the second link that you see here on this uh, page is um, with this site itself, and you can see we've just started it, so there's a few people listed there, and we're hoping uh, that more people will join in. Um, but our RFA just came out recently, and, um, and so people, are, if they're looking for colleagues to collaborate with them, this is a good way of doing it. And um, the webinar for RFA is uh, in a week from Monday, the 25th of September. And uh, also on that day, we're having another toolbox um, uh, webinar um, on BMSB. And we've got uh, uh, six people who are going to be here talking about BSB, BMSB management. So I hope you'll join us for that. And uh, there's going to be an archive of today's webinar um, on this link, and you can watch it as often as you like. And, um, and uh, with that, I will thank everybody for their time. Thank you, Julie. Thank you, Scott. I found it really interesting. And um, I'm sure if anyone has follow-up questions, um, please feel uh, free to contact uh, Julie or Scott um, uh, through iPipe. And uh, thank you very much, everyone, for your time today. I hope it was a good use of your time. <laughs>